Hey, good morning, everybody. It is Pastor Josh, and it is Tuesday, October 29th, my friends. Um, it is time for our daily devotional, and friends, as always, I hope that your day is off to a great start or that it has been going well, depending on when and where you might be listening or watching to this. Um, friends, again, as we come together into the spirit of our devotion, I just want us to Again, take some time to just calm and center ourselves to create a place and a space where, you know, all of our attention is on the presence of God and that we're really open to hear the things that he has to say to us this morning. So with that, friends, let us let us take just a moment and, and let us open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this day that you have given us. Lord, we thank you for the air in our lungs, for the ability to get up and get out of bed. And Lord, give us the the ability to move forward throughout our day to to see the things that you're doing in our lives, to go out and to be able to cooperate and participate in the things that you're doing and to go out and to care for and support our our family, our friends, our neighbors, and to be a light for you in this world. Lord, we know that, that for some of us there is difficulty, Lord, that, that maybe this morning we're struggling. Lord, we're we're struggling to open our eyes, we're struggling to get out of bed, we're we're dreading the things that need to be done this day. And so, Lord, I just ask that that you just place your hand upon those people this morning, that that they would feel your presence in such a tangible way that it would just be completely life-altering. Lord, that they would experience your peace, this peace that surpasses all understanding, and that they would know without a shadow of a doubt that you are with them each and every step of the way. Lord, not only that you're all around them, but though that your son Jesus lives within them. So Lord, bless them, keep them, hold them close today as they as they look to go about their day. Lord, we ask as we come into this devotion that, that again you would just prepare our hearts, our minds, and our our bodies to experience, to hear to hear the things that you have to say to us today. And Lord, help us to find ways to continually grow in our faith, seeking you out each and every day, making sure that you're the, the center of our lives, of the things that we speak, of the things that we do. And Lord, we thank you and praise you that you desire to be in relationship with us, that nothing makes you happier than to just spend time with us, to hear the things we have to say, and for us to share our lives with you. And so, Lord, we also ask that, that again, you speak to us and you share yourself with us this morning. Lord, I ask all these things in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. All right, friends. Well, we are continuing on in our um, devotional series, going through the Gospel of Mark. And again, today I'm going to do things just a little bit different like I did yesterday. Um, so I combined... Uh, multiple subheadings in our Bible, and I did that largely because they work really well together, and not that they can't be separated and, and dealt with, but um, it was just easier to understand all of the different pieces when they're together. And so today, friends, it's going to be the same thing. Um, there's a couple of, of pieces within the Gospel of Mark that I just feel like work better together than trying to do them completely um, separate. So today we are going to look at um, Mark chapter 11, verses 27, and we're going to go into chapter 12, um, verses 1 through 12, okay? And so in my, in my Bible, the subheadings are Jesus's, question, Jesus's authority is questioned in the parable of the wicked tenants. All right, so friends, let's begin with 11, um, verse 27. As always, hope you have your Bible with you or an app. 
Um, and I just invite you to, you know, follow along and as always to, to just make notations of the things that the Holy Spirit um, brings to your attention this morning. So it says again, they came to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him and said, By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? Answer me. They argued with one another, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But, <coughs> excuse me, shall we say of human origin, they were afraid of the crowd. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, folks. If we say of human origin, they were afraid of the crowd, and for all regarded John as a tr a truly a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Then he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, and dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When he came, he sent a slave to the tenants to collect, to them, collect from them his share of the produce of the vineyard. But they seized him and beat him, and they sent him away empty-handed. And again he sent another slave to them. This one they beat over the head and insulted. Then he sent another, and that one they killed. So it was with many others. So it was with many others. Some they bear, some they beat, and others they killed. He sti he had still one other, a beloved son. Finally he sent him to them, saying, "They will respect my son." But those tenants said to one another, "There, he there is the heir." Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him, killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing to our eyes. When they realized he had told this parable against them, they wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowd, so they left him and went away. All right, friends. Well, hopefully you're able to follow along through my, my coughing and, and misreading there, so I apologize for that. But, friends, as we go back, um, again, remember our devotion yesterday, you know, where where Jesus goes in and just kind of flips the temple upside down and, and really gets on people who are not honoring and, and doing um, the religious work that, that they had been instructed to do or, or in the way that they had been instructed to do it, right? And so I think part of the, part of the question here, and again, they've been, they've been questioning Jesus about how he's been doing his ministry since the very beginning. But now, you know, again, there seems, again, whether you want to say this is, this is Mark really kind of narrowing things in or, um, you know, trying to find a way to really get after Jesus. Because again, friends, if we think about it, as I said yesterday, imagine what would happen if Jesus came into our churches and and flipped them upside down, right? I, I, I think if we just think for a real moment, many of us would not be happy. Many of us would not be comfortable with that. We would try to kind of probably... I'm going to use that very loosely, we would probably try to justify what we were doing, right? And so, you know, they're looking for a way to kind of justify themselves. And so they come and they question Jesus and say, look, who do you think you are and why do you think you get to do this? By what authority um, have you been given? Now, it's interesting that they don't just run after him, right? Because they do have this fear, right? They're living in fear of of seeing Jesus' ministry grow. They do know, they've seen and witnessed the fact that he's able to do some pretty amazing things, things that they haven't been able to do. And yet they're very uncomfortable because they feel like their position is being challenged. 
right, by this man who, who is doing things much differently than they have. Now, Jesus, again, is a, is a pretty amazing guy, and I love that, um, you know, he just kind of goes toe to toe to him. He knows that, that they're obviously questioning his integrity, they're questioning his authority, and so he, you know, he just puts it right back on them, and he says, well, look, friends, I'll answer your question, but you have to answer one of these, right? And so he asks this beautiful question, and he says, well, you know, where does the baptism of John come from? Because, again, many of the people of the time went out to go seek out after John, right? Even even earlier in the gospel, we heard that, you know, even people like, like Herod and stuff kind of admired um, John the Baptist. They they were interested in his teaching and interested in the things that they that he had to say. But there was some politics that went on. They weren't, you know, his message wasn't always the most kind to certain certain people because he called them out, including the king, right? And so, um, you know, Herodias wasn't very happy that that her relationship with Herod had been called out because it wasn't it it wasn't as it should be. It wasn't proper. And so the religious leaders, again, are, are faced with the fact that they immediately know that they're kind of caught, right? They're caught between a rock and a hard place, so to speak, right? If they answer one way, you know, Jesus will say, then if you believe that John's baptism came from heaven, why didn't you believe him? Why, why didn't you follow it along, right? And <coughs> and, and, and again, the... The logical conclusion to this is that, again, John talked about the fact that he was preparing the way for someone else. And so if his baptism came from heaven and he was doing the work preparing the way for someone even greater than himself, what does that say to the religious leaders in not believing that it came from heaven? Now, on the other hand, they're caught between a very difficult place because if they say, well, this is just human origin, how do they deal with the massive amount of people that really truly believe that John was a prophet, right? And so they're caught between sort of this appealing to the crowd and to the people whom they're called to serve, and it's it's not going to look really good for them if they start taking up a position that's completely opposite to what many, many people feel and have experienced. Now again, G Jesus in his beauty doesn't leave it there, right? He he basically sets up for the religious leaders the answer to the question, although he does it in a way that that's more subtle, right? He tells a parable, he tells a story, and says, hey, do you get the point of this parable? And so he tells a parable of, of, of wicked tenants, of someone, of a, a, wine o a wine owner who creates this beautiful vineyard and sets it up, it's functional, it's designed to you know, produce good fruit, right? It's designed to produce wine, and he, he rents it out to these tenants, saying, look, you know, all I desire, you get to run it, you get to do these things, but I get my share, because I'm the one that set this up. And so the wine, the wine owner goes off to a different country to go do some other business, and he keeps sending people back um, to collect his fair share of... Um, the fruits of the of the vineyard, right? And each time, the people that are in charge of the vineyard, the tenants, they treat the the people that come to collect what's rightfully the the vineyard's owner, they treat them very poorly, even kill some of them. And then the story comes out. And Jesus really lays this out. Well, look, the owner had a son, right? Someone that he deeply loved, and they sent him, and and then they killed him, right? And so, friends, the, the, the sort of moral of the story is that, look, guys, God has been sending you vessels. God has been sending you people, the prophets, right, to come and collect and to show you that God is still present, to collect what's rightfully his. And each time, you don't get very happy when the prophets come up because they call you out on your stuff, right? Their message is not always one that's just super hopeful in the moment. There are times definitely that the that the prophets are very hopeful, but a lot of times they're speaking into some of the injustice that's going on in the present moment. And people don't like that, right? Prophets are not always well received because they're saying things that people don't want to hear. 
And and uh, once again, the religious leaders take up offense by this because he knows that he's cut them right to the heart because it's kind of like, how many prophets have you tried to get rid of? How many prophets have you tried to kill because they've actually spoken the message of God and you didn't want to hear it? And he, he quite lays it out. I mean, in, in this subtle way, he says, look, you know, I'm the son that the 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 owner sent and you're going to kill me too. But the stone that you reject is going to become the cornerstone for all things. And this is the Lord's doing. And so there's a foreshadowing here, friends, that's that's really important for us to understand. And friends, you know, as, as we go back, I, I think to make this a little bit more practical for us to understand this, you know, how, how do we really perceive the person of Jesus Christ? Right, you know, many of us, you know, we we have a reverence for Jesus. We we have accepted Jesus, and yet, have we really moved to that place in our relationship where where we too truly believe that He is who He says He is, or do we keep kind of waiting? Do we keep kind of, you know, this skeptical hands off? I'm going to keep you at arm's distance because I still want to go over and do all of the things that I want to do. Because here's here's kind of the the conclusion that I got in in I'm trying to think who said it. I it's not gonna come to me this morning, I don't think. But you know, either Jesus is who he says he is, or he's a crazy guy. Right? He's he's off his rocker to claim to be the son of God and be able to do all of these things. And if he's absolutely crazy and none of this is true, then what does that say for those of us who follow him? If, on the other hand, he truly is who he says he is, then, friends, we have to take a a good look at our inner lives and say, okay, if, if Jesus really is who he says he is, and I claim to make him the Lord and the Savior of my life, why do I keep doing the things that I do? Why is Jesus not the epicenter of the things that I think, the things that I speak, the things that I do? And why so often am I worried about my agenda and the things that I want to do versus, you know, making sure that the things that that I'm doing are in in alignment with the things that Jesus is calling me to do. And friends, this is something for us to, for all of us to wrestle with. And now I'm not, again, I, I feel like when I make comments like that, it's it's to encourage us to really think deeply about that for our lives it's not this call to put on this facade to try to be perfect right because jesus knows we're not going to be perfect but jesus does call us to continue to grow in that relationship and we have that opportunity each and every day and what does that what does it look like then as we live into that relationship each and every day growing and then living out of that relationship in all that we do. And friends, I I would say that that would just have to be transformative, not only for us personally, but it would be transformative for our families, for our churches, for our communities, for the world, right? To, To see people just live into that relationship with Jesus and have Jesus just flow out of them in everything that they do. I, I That couldn't help but transform the world in an amazing way, let alone us as individuals. And so, friends, let's, let's take that seriously and, and think about how that shows up in our lives. And again, sometimes we can we can say, hey, you know what, I, I've done a good job. I've walked through this season. I've, I've done these things as Jesus has called me to do. And we can celebrate that, right? And then there's also times that we have to, you know, do some some self-examination and say, okay, where can I make improvements? Where is God calling me to, to step in? Are there things that I need to release and get rid of because they're not serving me? And in fact, maybe they're maybe they're doing the exact opposite, right? Maybe they're pulling me away from my relationship with Jesus rather than helping me to live and lean into that. So friends, you know, I, I just invite us to kind of sit with that today and, and to think about who Jesus truly is for us and, and what that really means. And that's, again, that's a really, really deep 
um, a deep, deep question for us to consider because we can spend a lot of time. We should spend the rest of our life considering that at different times in different places. Because again, what does it mean when Jesus becomes the very cornerstone upon which our life is built rather than just some brick that we keep there and say, oh, look, yep, I got Jesus. He's he's in the... He's in the wall. He's in the framework somewhere. somewhere. Or, look, no, Jesus is the cornerstone upon which the foundation of my entire life is built upon. right? And if you remove that cornerstone, this building falls down. So, friends, I invite you to think and consider that this morning. <coughs> As always... Um, I would love to hear some of your perspectives, experiences. If you have questions, feel free to put those in the chat. Um, again, friends, if there are things that we can do to pray for you today or come alongside of you, please don't hesitate to reach out and let us know how we might be able to support you. And friends, we will be back tomorrow morning um, at 8 a.m. Oh, one quick more, one more quick blurb. If you're in the Bloomer in New Auburn area, um, our youth group is doing a, a harvest festival up at the New Auburn Church tomorrow night from 6:30 to 8. So if you have kids, grandkids, neighbor kids, um, you know, please bring them on up. We've got some, we've got some games, some spooky Bible stories, and and some sweet treats for your kiddos. So if you're up and about in this area, we'd love to, to see you. And our youth group has organized this and put this on and designed it. And so um, it's just a great opportunity for them to uh, minister to the people in our community. So I would just ask that you hold them in prayer, but also come participate if you're around. All right, friends, with that, we will catch you tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. God bless. Have an amazing rest of your day.